Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel, best place for long-term stock investors. And of course, in this episode of Quick Dive, we're going to talk about three companies or three events. Um, of course, I think everyone knows in the news, Serba Dynamic, we can't avoid talking about it. We kind of didn't want to talk about it, but I guess we have to now. Yep. That's one. The second one will be Perkat's IPO, right? The stock went up quite a lot. And then the last one will be a familiar name, but a very a familiar but unpopular name in the stock market, which is Astro and it's a, you know, Netflix relationship. Mm -hmm. So last Thursday, we had a very interesting webinar where we identified the criteria of looking for 10 baggers. Uh, we just turned on the replay this morning because there were so many requests. And if you want to watch that replay, the link is down in the comment section below. All right, John, let's start with uh, Astro. Mm -hmm. They've got a new girlfriend. <laughs> right? How many girlfriends do they Netflix, have? Netflix, <laughs> right? They, just a while back, they had another girlfriend, which yeah. was uh, Disney. Disney Plus. Now they are you know, together. And the question is, why are they doing this, right? Mm. So maybe you set some context. And if you look at my uh, screen right here, yeah, basically, right, over the past, uh, since they listed, right, revenue has been flat, right? It went up a little bit during 2017, 2018. But uh, basically, yeah, it's flat, like 0 point something percent growth. Yeah. And uh, no surprise, since it's listing, Astro is down 62%. Uh, percent. Mm. Now, what's interesting about Astro is that I know, you know, my my, my parents know that they're a bit older and in that circle, they like to look for like cash flow kind of stocks, right? Dividend yeah, stocks. That's right. And Astro, right, if you look on my screen right now, uh, dividend yield 7.5%. Wow. But of course... <laughs> Yeah, the dividend is high, but then the price drops faster than the dividend <laughs> just go up. That's right? why the yield go up because price yeah. is coming down. <laughs> exactly, right? So it's not done well since it's IPO, mm. right? In fact, I can I really can't find anyone or who has made money off Astro. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you're in the comment uh, section, you can let us know if you've ever made money on Astro before. However, uh, since October last year, it's uh, in on a mini tear, right? It's about 47% up. Ah. And, you know, maybe, you know, they are quite, the market is quite excited that Astro is pairing up with Netflix. And that could be Netflix. the catalyst of why the market is on the tail. Yes. Yeah. But of course, we look beyond the news. Yes. We don't look at prices to tell us information. Price mm. is just a price. It yeah. just tells you what the market thinks. Yeah. So the question is, what do you think? Like, is this the right move? And are they going to turn things around by doing this? Uh, I certainly hope so, but to be honest, I mean, if, you, if you're looking at the packages that are mm -hmm. on offer, right, it still ties you to a device. Yeah. And I, 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 for, the, for the life of me, I can't fathom why they still need to tie you to a device because yeah. today... Uh, I think they call it the, the ultra boxes. Right? Yeah, the ultra boxes. Um, the other thing that I don't like about being tied down to a device on, on top of being tied down to the device right. is that they force you. Like, for example, I don't mind subscribing to Disney Hotstar, to be honest, mm -hmm, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm a, a big subscriber of Netflix. I love it. Uh, I, I tried looking at what makes sense to me to subscribe to Disney Hotstar. And I'm actually forced to take up a lot of channels on Astro that mm -hmm. I don't like. Yeah. This is where the bundling for me seriously doesn't work. Lah. I... Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, you order those uh, like multi-assorted biscuit tins. Mm, then correct, you, you actually you just want the, the chocolate chip. Correct. Maybe you exactly. want the strawberry, but yeah. you don't want the raisin. Yeah, right? exactly. So I, I, I do think that another thing to consider is the fact that because Astro needs to be a bit more Malaysia friendly. Yeah. And one of the draws for Netflix, why people buy, apart from the fact that you can get like five devices for 55 ringgit, right? Yeah. Is the fact that you don't get censorship, heavy mm, censorship. Correct. And I suspect, of course, they've not started it. I could be proven wrong. But yeah. my suspicion is that Astro is going to censor quite a lot of things. Uh, yeah. And basically, you take the fun out of things, right? For yeah. kids, it's no problem. Correct. But for adults, people with disposable income, that's uh, going to be a problem. Actually, Netflix already done that pretty well. Uh, yeah. There's a pin. So that means if you want to watch uh, PG-rated content or anything uh, yeah. that's more violent... Um, you know, because I have kids at home, right? 
Yes. Their, their profile is set to uh, child-friendly content. Yeah. And if, even if they accidentally go and search for, let's just say, uh, PG-rated content, right? They need a pin to actually access it. So I think rather than allow, uh, allow self-censorship, rather than, you know, letting, letting some higher figure or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll bring on one other point and see whether you agree with me. Is yeah. that, so... Companies like Astro survive because they have certain um, legal benefits. Monopolistic benefits. Right, they have monopolistic <laughs> uh, benefits. Right? Only they can have satellite. Not, not a lot of people can have satellites correct, in Malaysia. Correct, like, correct. I, last I checked. Like, huh? Correct. So that's why people stuck to Astro for the longest time. That's right. right? And today, even though I don't use Astro pretty much 99% of my week, mm. I still use that 1% to 5% because of football. Ah, because only they have the right. Like Netflix don't have the right to broadcast uh, a sports. Man United game, right? Yeah. Only Astro. So it got me thinking, right? What if Astro, if they pair on with Netflix and then maybe they are trying to recreate the monopolistic um, situation mm. where if you want either he talk to Netflix and the government yeah, and they team up and they say, if you want to watch Netflix, you can only watch it through Astro. Mm. That is a reality that obviously I think a lot of people don't want. But what do you think the likelihood is for something like that to happen? Uh, I mean, because this is important for for an investor. Because correct, if correct. that happens, yeah, then you know it could be an interesting stock to look at. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest, government policies, or even related yeah. to this, uh, I, I some context as well. You know, this they are talking about the MAHB with Subang, and then they want to carve out the mm. yeah. In a way, MAHB are subsidizing the non-profit-making uh, airports. Right, right. Because Subang's profitable. Mm. And I'm using that as an example to draw towards this Netflix and that uh, 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 pairing up with Astro and all that, right? I don't think Astro is subsidizing any loss-making entity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if the government were to kind of force his hand or their hand on it, right? I, I, I think that it's uh, less rational. Mm -hmm. to do that because here they are uh, they are already um, what do you call it um, making a lot of money from advertisements being right. monopolistic in the first place and they're not subsidizing non-profit making entities all right, right yeah so if the government were to do that I really question the rationale of that yeah. putting in that monopolistic thing that's a very polite way of saying no <laughs> very interesting yeah yeah I think uh, do you have anything else to say about uh, no I, I just hope that um, you know if you want to bundle something just bundle I, I think Okay lah, they bundle with one spot, the, the yeah. cheapest package, right? 55. Uh, but then, if I just want Disney, why can't I just, just download and an app? You know what's the problem with that also? It's 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 going back to, in a way, old tech, sticking to old traditions always. Yes. Because when you use a box, what does that mean? It means you have to watch your TV. Yes. But people exactly. watch their... I don't know about you, but when I binge watch a series, it's on my desktop. Yeah, same. Or on my phone. <laughs> or a tablet. Right. So... <laughs> Yeah, I I mean there's there's more for me to say obviously, but I think uh you know that those are our thoughts on Astro. Yep. Okay, guys. Uh, before we move on, I uh, got something very interesting to announce to you. So a lot of people always ask us on Instagram, uh, Facebook, Facebook, social media, and all that uh, to analyze the uh, to analyze their stocks or maybe they've done some research. And usually we don't do it because it takes a little bit of time. Uh, but recently we have been uh, more open to it. In fact. We are looking forward to it now. So if you have some sort of stock that has been on your mind, you've done a lot of research, and you know the thing about stock research is that it can be quite uh, confusing, right? There's a lot of data, and sometimes it's hard to organize your thoughts. If you need, uh, if you want us to give you a free review, just email us a PDF copy of your research to hello at firo.co or .co. So H-E-L-L-O at F-I-R-L dot C-O. We'll take a look at it. We'll review it for free and we'll get back to you uh, about the soundness or how good your research is. Okay, now we talk about uh, probably, the, probably the, ho the hottest IPO over the past week mm. happened on June uh, 23rd. IPO at 32 cents and that is Pekat. Funny name though for a solar company. Very, very interesting. It's a solar company and yeah. before that actually... Um, it was reported that Perkat's IPO would be uh, was oversubscribed by seventy six times. Mm. So it's like um, 
the pressure was very high for the stock to go up. <laughs> and so no surprise, yeah. uh, it went to uh, 74 cents. So it du- doubled. Doubled, yeah. So it doubled in a day. And why it has doubled? Well, quite simply, is because, um, and we'll talk a little about it, it's a bit later, Malaysia is pretty into solar, renewable yeah. energies. So that's that's right. very interesting, even for an oil gas nation. Mm. And what Pekat does is basically they are what we call an EPCC contractor, right? So they, they build uh, solar PVs mm. and they also build the plant itself. Yeah. And then they've also got a side, uh, a second revenue stream, which is ELP. Maybe from the construction line, you want to explain a little bit about what ELP is? Mm. Yeah, so ELP, uh, if you see chaos thunderstorms that you, mm. you know, it's very frequent, right? Mm-hmm. And if you live in a high rise building, especially, right? Right. Uh, the electrical system needs uh, what we call earthing protection because the mm. moment a thunder strikes, right, you need it to be earth properly. If not, you're gonna fry a lot of the circuits. So Correct. this is the part where uh, ELP, the ELP side of the business for Pekat is uh, Right. Yeah. So on your on your slides, uh, there's a breakdown, right? Uh, yeah. They actually have three divisions, right? We don't talk too much about the trading division, but basically yeah. in 2020, mm. 57%, nearly two thirds came from the solar business yeah. and then the ELP business, which is construction related. That's right. Uh, 21% and then trading division about 21% as well. Yeah. So during COVID, it got hit a little bit bad. Mm-hmm. That's why revenue is a little bit flat, although it is actually flat even when you compare it to 2018, I believe. Two years before, yeah. Two years before. So now, we go about uh, starting this by saying, okay, like what? how do you understand the, what we call the cash flow stress schedule of the company? Is it is it a recurring business model or is it something else? Um, any EPCC contractor right. is very similar to a construction contractor. Right. Yeah. Uh, obviously for Pekat, their niche is actually uh, PV uh, businesses, but... Uh, what's interesting is that their older book in their prospectus, mm-hmm. they've already shown it all the way till 2024, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So absent of a few things are one is that what is their average hit rate for a contract yeah. bidding? So every time you bid, uh, if you ask any construction company or if you analyze any construction company, there's always a contract hit rate. Lah. So anything more than 20%, I think is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think how Pekat does this is actually up. Uh, to increase their chances is actually pairing up with uh, good infrastructure uh, infrastructure owners. I think for the lack of a better word, mm-hmm. guys like Sunway and guys Mega like First. Mega First. Yeah, so yeah. I think that helps in their contract. Speaking, with, uh, speaking of Mega First, uh, Mega First, I think contributes roughly today about mm-hmm. 40% of their contract wow. sales. Yeah, it's big. So it's 33 uh, million, I believe, out of 70, almost 80 uh, million worth of yeah. sales. So that's uh, that's not bad, right? And that's, I think, one of the things that got me interested and wanting to talk about this uh, stock because of the relationship to MFCB. Correct. And MSCB is known to be a company that, you know, turns a lot of things into gold. Mm-hmm. So perhaps, and, and this is important because it's almost as if any solar EPC contracts that MSCB gets, they will throw it to... to Pekat. So it's like they are their sold uh, EPCC contract or trusted EPCC contractor. La. Correct. But of course, this doesn't mean you might, people might think, oh, that means it's a 100% hit rate no. from MFCB. In a way, yes, but in a way, no, because MFCB itself also needs Yes. So the hit rate we were discussing about this uh, yeah. earlier on. Yeah. Now, uh, let's talk a bit about the IPO proceeds. Yes. Right. So the IPO proceeds, uh, big chunk of it, I think 18 million, if I remember correctly. Correct. Is going to be for a head office and an operational facility. Mm-hmm. So one of the interesting things about EPC is that it's a pretty capex intensive company. Yes. But they even before listing. I checked out the numbers. Pekka was pretty decent, their balance sheet. It was mm. quite okay. Not not laden in debts or, you know, stuck no, in cash flow. They yeah. were net debt before yeah. the IPO, but because of the IPO, then now they're net cash. Mm. I think they have like 28 million versus I think 17 million of debt or something like that. Okay. So in, in your experience, right, like um, is, is it, why do you think they're doing what do you think of setting up a new head office and an operational facility? Uh, great question. If you look at um, what was written, um, right. they want it to be not just an operational facility to have nice headquarters, but actually to be more efficient in showcasing their technology. Ah. 
So that was uh, one of the main reasons why they, they need a fresh design rather than taking something and retrofitting it. So it's fresh from the ground design. Right. Second thing is they wanted to be more efficient in their stacking. So that was one of the key insights I got from their, from right. their listing prospectus. Because, you know, so uh, if you are a solar contractor, you need a good place to store and stack all your monocrystalline or uh, polycrystalline uh, cells, right? And I right. think that was mentioned why they need this new facility so that they are more efficient in their storing of all these uh, PV cells before they actually construct them. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. So uh, I remember you had a slide about uh, PV growth, right? Yes. So is it is it good? Is it optimistic? Yeah. What was interesting was that I, I went around looking at cost of kilowatt ah. per... Uh, cost of kilowatt per... Uh, yeah, yeah, just cost of kilowatt mm -hmm. for each mm -hmm. uh, different en en energy source. And, you know, in the past, because I'm an elect electrical engineer by training, right? I've always yeah. believed that gas, when, I, when <laughs> especially when I used to work in Shell, I always believed that gas was one of the cheapest. So I mm -hmm. went and do a little bit of digging and I found this law, which was uh, this law called Swanson's Law. <laughs> Ah. Okay, so Sunset's Law is very similar to Moore's Law where it doubles, you know, chip right, capacity right, doubles. Right. But this one is, Sunset's Law just dictates that for every doubling of shipment, mm -hmm. uh, your price reduction is 20% for wow. cost. Yeah. So at this point, right, what, what, what was interesting was in 1977 where uh, uh, PV was first, kind of first introduced, it was at $76 per kilowatt. Okay. Today, it's about 30 cents. Mm. So if you do some research on your own for the audience out there, you realize that right now, um, solar is among the cheapest. Right. And it didn't, it wasn't in the past because of the cost of manufacturing for the solar cells. And in the past, I think a lot of it was heavily subsidized. Remember we had correct, this, correct, this correct. discussion before. So now it makes economic sense. For us, right, whenever we looked at uh, um, any technology, it must make economic sense of course, of course. rather than it being oh, it's, it's the latest thing, but yeah, can can we produce this economically right. viable? Yeah. And what's pushing this drive is also the government. Yes. Right? I think in, in one of your slides. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, quite, I actually didn't know this, uh, but thanks to, you know, Perkat's uh, IPO and all that, they actually, you know, gov Malaysian government has a lot of projects supporting... Incentives, actually. Yeah, a lot of incentives. So yeah. that's a good thing. But yeah. here's the thing, right? let's tie back to your earlier point about uh, Swanson's Law, right? Yeah. I know it sounds abstract to you guys listening, but let me explain to you why this is relevant, how this can actually affect the business. So every shipment, right, mm. of uh, every doubling of shipments of yeah. solar PVs will re will produce a 20% reduction in cost. That's right. So what that means, right, is that if you don't increase your capacity as a solar PV provider or manufacturer and all that, right, mm -hmm. If you stay at the same capacity, yes. your revenue falls over time. You know that's right. So what does that mean? Well, that means you have to consistently be expanding your capacity. That's right. So what does that mean? You have to spend a lot more money. Mm. And so the question is, right? Is there a way? And, and here's the thing: solar PV is a commodity. It's yeah. like gold. It's like wood or anything. Yes. You 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 don't sell your your. Your solar PVs to be, uh, there's no branding. <laughs> there's no Apple solar PV. Yeah. You, and the reason why is because yeah. when you create a solar PV, yeah. you're sending it usually to an engineer or someone who knows it, right? Correct. Engineers, a bit difficult to bluff, right? Yeah. Apple phone users like me can bluff, you know? <laughs> but engineers are a bit more difficult. So there's no branding on the product That's side. right, that's right. And so really the big question is, and why I'm bringing this up is that if you want to see whether per cut or any stock that is in solar uh, for that matter, is you want to see, right, how do they manage their costs? Yes. What, do they have a cost advantage? Uh, yeah. The fact that you pause means it's quite difficult. It's quite find. difficult. One is, is because um, they don't manufacture it at scale at the moment. That's right. That's right. So that's why... It, for bargaining I, I, and... Yeah. That's why I was thinking, can they actually reduce their costs? Uh, unless... Mm -hmm. Unless they, they don't even want to do that, they just yeah. partner with the best manufacturer, like you know, like TSMC partnering yeah. with all these big guys and just contract it out. Uh, the other way I think they can reduce their costs is actually through a lot of these government incentives. Yeah. So, but here's interesting, right? You yeah. mentioned that the government incentives, though, is beneficial to the company, but really every other guy's guy gets Get, it. So. Yeah. 
That's right. Right. So unless you have some special insight that the only this guy, only Picard or whoever can get it, yeah. it's not really an advantage. I also thought of one, maybe it's the labor, mm. but there again, I don't see it because everyone, you know, Solar Vest, Samaden, all these other guys Correct. at ABC yeah. also have the same labor, right? Yeah. So I think that is really good insight. The fact that we are struggling to find an advantage <laughs> tells you that, you know, that these are the problems with Picard and these are the problems with EPCC. Any construction company, I think... Uh, their biggest uh, um, advantage is actually trust. Uh. In a way, trust in the sense that the moment uh, you've used them before, yeah. you want to use them because of the quality of their work, timely delivery, and you know, all that kind of thing. But in an open tender kind of bidding, sometimes you cannot exert, because it's very subjective. Uh, how right. do you put trust as a, a, yeah. a, a, what do you call it, a tender criteria to put there, you see? Yeah, I mean, trust comes with time, right? Yeah. So I think that the price shooting up so much is actually linked to our, my next point, which yeah. is the valuations. Mm, what's the valuations so now? So it this is quite amazing actually. I'm not sure what the investment bankers were doing when mm. they IPO, right? But they managed to IPO at 50, 15 times One earnings. five, right? <laughs> so today it doubled. So right roughly right now it's like 35 times earnings. Uh -huh. But it's still lower than the competitors with Samaden. Solar Vest. And Solar Vest, which yeah. is anywhere, it depends on the price moves so much, right? Yeah. But it's anywhere between like 45 to 60. So you're you're still paying a cheaper valuation as compared to the guys that listed earlier than them? Well, right now, it's not by call, yeah. but you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and that's why also, tying back to the first point, is why it was oversubscribed 76 times is precisely because of this. Yeah. The yeah. valuation was, uh, you know, Super, super low. I think uh, in, in the investment bank speak, is leaving money on the table. <laughs> yeah, but you see, that's that's the funny <laughs> thing. Because investment bankers don't leave money on the table. Yeah, normally they don't they leave money it, on the table. They take everything, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I think, you know, this is definitely a stock we, we, we do want to look at because yeah. I, don't, I know it sounds like we're making it negative, but I think when it comes to per cut, it still generates about a 10% net profit margin. Yeah. So, and for IBCC, that's really pretty, not pretty bad. Pretty decent. Pretty it's decent. Not bad. So yeah. definitely something we'll be, uh, you know, looking out uh, for the future. Yeah. If you're enjoying the video so far, as usual, remember to like, uh, comment, subscribe, share it with your friends if you, f if you think they will find it useful. And of course, never, never forget to click on the notification bell so that whenever new updates or new videos that we have, you get it fresh in your inbox. Okay, John, finally, Serba DK or Serba Dynamic. Or oh, the um, evergreen topic that never dies. Man, you're gonna, <laughs> I just hope in a way, you know, the thing is we do we do all this and, uh, you know, we get pretty good views for our Serba videos. Yeah. But actually, I secretly hope that we don't have to talk about this in the next month. But I suspect that we will be talking about it mm -hmm. again. The saga is not over. There is yeah. no conclusion. And so basically, anyway, just to update uh, from our previous video, right? Uh, you know, 22nd of June, KPMG was called mm -hmm. a shop lot auditor, <laughs> right? They have like 200,000 over staff, you know, hundreds of officers globally. With, with a market cap of about 200 billion, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. the company calling them a shop yeah. lot auditor is like, what, 2 billion market cap? <laughs> but I mean, I feel bad for sh actual shop, shop lot auditors. Uh, <laughs> I think they are... <laughs> Give them some slack. Right? Correct, correct. So anyway, yeah. So basically, they were called by the chairman of uh, Server Dynamic. The new chairman, you mean? The, the, yeah, correct. <laughs> and then after that, um, Server decided to sue KPMG mm. for a very interesting reason. We should talk about it <laughs> later on. Yeah. Right? Uh, but, you know, the market didn't care. They just kept selling. Yeah. Then after that, four of the independent directors decided to resign because they didn't agree with the lawsuit. Correct. And okay. Masa. So the 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 plot thickens, yeah. right? Even more drama now. And then KPMG decided uh, to quit. Yeah. All right. So um Server Dynamic, it's 34 cents as of this recording. And uh it's pretty much down uh almost 80%. Yeah. 80%. Now, now, going to your screen, right? Uh, this is from Serba Dynamic itself. Uh, this is the, I believe this is the writ of yeah, summons. Yeah, this is the writ of summons. Um, this is the, the legal letter, basically, and saying that one of the things that, that is highlighted here, and which I find to be a bit weird, is that they are suing KBMG for market cap loss. <laughs> and so the joke I give to our, you know, our research team is that 
So if let's say the market cap bounces back up, right? Yeah. Are they going to pay back KPMG yeah. after KPMG pays them? <laughs> Re- right back. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, my market cap back. Okay. I pay you the remainder yeah. now. No, will KPMG get a bonus if the market cap goes even higher than the previous one? You know? And it means like 5 billion down to 2. Exactly. <laughs> got to pay, right? So I know, John, I know it's, uh, it's been a quick minute since mm. we did uh, the Serba video. So just to update all of us now, right? I think I want to start off uh, by. Sorry, just to update uh, the viewers, I'll start by ex- driving a little bit deeper into some of the financials. Yeah. Because one thing I talked about in the previous video was that actually through the financials alone, you could see yes. that there were certain orange flags. Yes. And I, I, you know, we didn't have slides then to show. So now today, uh, you've prepared some slides. Yep. So very interestingly, yeah. Uh, um, we did mention about the divergence in between the earnings of the company and the cash flow. And right. we verbalized that, but now we have it very clearly. As you can see, the most recent uh, numbers that they're producing, even though they had good net income, 700 over a million, but their cash flow is 9.75. So it's like, there's this huge divergence, huge, huge, huge. huge divergence. And what really caught my eye as well, as I was discussing with you earlier, was actually... Most people compare their cash yeah. with the total liabilities. And uh, some, you know, then you can determine whether it's a net cash company or right, a net right. debt company, right? And as I was, I was looking, right, they raise money not from just uh, debts, you know, they raise from issuance of stock, mm-hmm. also they raise from debt. Of course. And what was interesting when I plotted this neck, by, neck to neck, right, <laughs> the amount of cash was actually only half of what they issued in stocks as well as debt for 2021, the latest one. So where do you, where do you all go? Right? Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, you are opening up a black hole. Just give me money, give me money. Yeah, yeah. I'm running, running business. And the last number, uh, I'm just going to make it quick. The last number that <laughs> really interesting was that we wanted to see how efficient they were managing uh, cap- equity or capital being given to them. And if you plot this out, return on equity and return on uh, invested capital, right? It seems pretty decent, uh, mm-hmm. especially in year 2015 where they had a 200 over percent of ROE. But then it got me thinking as well, MJ. Return on equity and return on invested capital is measured against net profit. Correct. And net profit is the number that is very diverging from the cash flow. So yeah. the real uh, measurement shouldn't be measured against net earnings when there is already a question mark in the next earnings. Net exactly, earnings. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's a, that's a really good point on the the financials. So I hope you guys enjoyed the, the breakdown on this. Now, it's not just the amount of money they raise, it's what they do with the money. Correct. And that's where I want to get into uh, EPCC contracts mm. because previously they were doing maintenance uh, work for yeah. uh, oil platforms. And then now they're actually going into building yeah. uh, some of these platforms. Yeah. Right? So when they spend so much money, you see, as an investor, what I like is that if a company spends a lot, that's totally fine. Yes. If they borrow, they raise capital, they write issue and all that. And then they spend on something where it's a lot of upfront spending. Correct. But over time, they can collect uh, a lot of revenue. So yes. a good example would be like Amazon. They Correct. spend a lot of money on storage. Yes. Because uh, they have a lot of data and then they decide to sell that data. So every time they sell that data, they don't need to spend money anymore because Correct. they spend so much on their set data centers. Really. Yeah. It's incremental scalability, you know. Correct. Yeah. So, But where this is very different for Serba is that when they go into EPCC, they get a contract, mm-hmm. they spend the money, they buy the raw materials, hire the people and all that. They build the thing and that's it. Yeah. And then they have to go and fight for the next contract. And they're going to fight for the next contract. <laughs> right? Yeah. And speaking of contracts, right? I know that in terms of their contract awards, mm. they're a bit opaque. Do you have yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's um, one is they don't really divulge their hit rate. Second thing is, I think where the discrepancy of the latest few contracts actually raises the question. And that, that was the question that the auditors actually asked because exactly. who actually but is four, the client? Four billion or four and a half billion worth of uh, transactions oh. not accounted for. Correct. So it's like, is it really left pocket, right pocket? I mean, we're not making course, a statement. We don't know. We don't, we don't know. know. It's still being investigated. Correct. Right? But it does raise questions when your client is like, uh, what is the capitalization of your client? If your client is only having a paid out of 100,000, how can they award a contract yeah. 1 billion? You know, it, it just raises questions. Uh. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about the lawsuit a bit right now. Yeah. How likely is it you think that, uh, you know, Silva can actually pull, pull, this off, of, uh, pull this off? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know to be honest, yeah. but I I doubt KPMG would have gone into this and mm. declared this publicly unless they were very very sure of it. Oh that, yeah, that, that's my gut feel because one big reputation at stake. Two, uh, you're talking about repercussions of you know um how it would come back and, hit, yeah. and bite you lah. I I I think they really thought through it, especially yeah. the signing part. If I'm not mistaken, certain government agencies in Malaysia are already saying that KPJ. KPMG is just doing their job. Yeah. And I think, I, I can't remember which section of the law. SC actually said that they, they cannot be sued. It's their professional opinion. They cannot be sued. Yeah. yeah. If you so, don't like the opinion, change uh, the opinionator. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And SC, I, I'm looking at it. They're pretty neutral at the moment, I think. Uh, the jury is still out. But they are very likely to cite KPMG. Lah, I look at it. Yeah, because they're just doing their job. Yeah. Right? Just yeah. pull out the number. Just, you know, they're just asking Serba to be more transparent Correct. about how things are going about, Correct. right? And it could be the case that a lot of these phrases like shop lot auditors, uh, all these other things, right? Resigning is just drama to mask the simple fact that... Precisely. I think he's I... He's just yeah. produced the supporting documents yes. to justify. And that's what the investigation is for right yeah. now. And we'll, we'll see as an investor. Now, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen as an investor. So let's say... Let me bring two scenarios. The first scenario is the guy who already holds Serba. Serba. And now you're down, let's say 80%. Mm. What do you do, man? <laughs> Average down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you can either rough it out mm. and think that because Sub, uh, the, uh, Datuk Karim is coming out with a lot of statements saying business as usual, business mm. is running. Uh, for you, who are already shareholders, you could probably do more digging yourself, meaning other channels to find out whether is this business really legit or not. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of effort. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of effort. Uh, second thing is just uh, move on. Uh. There's a lot of other companies that are very profitable. Um, yeah. And the losses that you bear right now can be easily overcome over, uh, yeah. you know, over a period of time once you move on. Uh. Yeah. And before we end the second scenario, which is, uh, the, and there's a big scenario, uh, there's a big group of people right now who are looking at Serba and they're like, it's eight times earnings, it's five times earnings, oh, yeah. maybe it'll be three times earnings soon, right? Yeah. And they are saying that, hey, um, and this kind of makes sense to me in, in a way that, yes, there's a lot of uncertainty. Yes, there's so many things that could go wrong. But because the valuation is so cheap, mm. right, your downside is quite low. Yeah. But then if, let's say, Serba Dynamic is proven innocent, mm. the gain is going to be very big. Yeah, massive, massive. So I think that's something, uh, that's the interesting thing about investing, guys, because it's not uh, either or, it's not you're wrong and you're right. There's it's, no binaries. Uh. Yeah, it's when you go in, it's... Uh, at the valuations you go in at mm. and your understanding, it's the amount of money you put in is, I hate to use the word, but it's your risk appetite yeah. and things like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, investing is not clear cut black and white. Especially those who are bondholders uh, because in a way, seniority and all that. I think that that's yeah. what a lot of this group that you mentioned yeah. are riding on uh, because the risk in a way is slightly lower than that of equity holders. Uh. Correct. Yeah. But it'll be very interesting, yeah. right, to see the cash flow collection yeah. because if, Serba so, Dynamic does collect more cash flow as time passes, mm. i.e. the contracts are legit. Yeah. Then certainly right now is an absolute steal. Steal, yes. All right, that's it for the uh, quick dive session this week. See you guys.